sit on a meditation cushion in our living room by ourselves or go for a solo walk in the woods. Those aren't our only spiritual practices because we also need the practice of a community that distracts us a little bit. The practice of a community that has goings on and noises and feelings and needs that call our attention in all different directions so that we can work on calling it back and back and back again to this moment. I hope we're able to do that this morning and every morning that we're together. I invite you now to join with me in singing our first hymn, which is number 1031. This morning, instead of a story, we have, uh, since we're talking about spiritual practices, this morning we have a meditation for all ages. And I'd like to start by inviting all of our small folks to come forward. If you'd like to sit here in front, I'm going to need a little help from you. And if you need to bring a bigger person with you, that's okay, too. We'll welcome that. But while you come forward, I'm going to tell you a very short story about this meditation for all ages. We're going to learn a chant this morning, and then we're going to teach it to the grown-ups. You can sit right here in front of me, and then you'll have a good view, and you'll be right where you need to be to teach it to the grown-ups. I'm sure we'll be very patient with them if they're slow to learn. <laughs> so this is a chant that I learned at First Unitarian Church in Rochester. When I was there, I was teaching a preschool RE class for three- and four-year-olds. And Sheila Shu, their religious education director, would sing parts of this chant with all the kids every Sunday. She would teach them to sing when they started their children's service together. Breathe in, breathe out, and they would breathe when they did it. Breathe in, breathe out. And she would tell us that's a time for us to focus on our breath and pay attention to our breath, and it can help us to be calm in situations where we might not feel like we have control of our thoughts or our bodies or our feelings. And that's what we <coughs> use that chant for. And so I had a friend in my three and four year old class, let's call him Anthony. And he maybe he might have been called wild from time to time. He had a lot of energy in his body and he had trouble controlling that energy in a way that maybe was safe all the time or following the rules. Anthony struggled with that because he just had so much energy inside of him. Did you ever feel like that? No, that's great. I do. <laughs> so Anthony's dad told me this story about how Anthony had gotten into some mischief and his dad was really unhappy with him and started to feel angry and he yelled at him a little bit. He said, Anthony, I need you to just take a time out and go to your room. And later, a few minutes later, his dad walked past his room Anthony had walked to his room really angrily, and when his dad walked past, he saw Anthony in front of his mirror singing to himself, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And his dad thought, maybe there's a lesson I could learn from Anthony here about how to control my anger, how to be in charge of my feelings and my body when the feelings get too big to hold. So I want to teach this meditation, this chant, it's a meditation in the form of a chant, and then we'll teach it to the grown-ups, and then we'll all sing it together. So you already learned the first part, the breathe in, breathe out. Can you sing that with me? Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Another part we sing, I want Bill's help for this part. Can you sing it through for us once and then we'll copy you? When I breathe in, I breathe in.
We'll invite them to sing with us. Okay? Are you ready, grown ups?
doesn't. Doesn't mean that it's never important, but in the moments of moral crisis, reason is lost on us. It just doesn't come into play. He said instead that asking people what they were thinking was not the right strategy. In a crisis, we're not thinking. We might decide later when the crisis is over that of course we were thinking all along, making reasonable decisions, but that's not really how our brains work. Neither, he says, is strong feeling leading us in a crisis. It's a blessing, really, that these heroes were not feeling extra empathy, because relating too strongly to another person's pain can freeze us. Studies show an excess of empathy can actually cause us to turn away from someone else's problem because it overwhelms us. So it's not reasoning better or feeling better that makes us be better. But here's what he did say. Scientists know a lot about how an explicit task, something we're thinking consciously about how to do, becomes an implicit task, something we do without thinking about. The answer is practice. So maybe compassion, even the most <coughs> self-sacrificial, heroic, poetry-worthy compassion, can really be that simple. It's not something we're born with, or culturally inherit, or reason our way into. It's something we learn by practice. Sapolsky likens this to learning to play the piano. He says that, when a pianist is learning a new piece or a new skill, they're thinking carefully about how to do it. They get to the difficult place in the music and think, here it comes, remember to tuck your elbow and use this finger and not that one, and remember last time how it didn't work and change it this time there. It's an explicit task. They're thinking it through. And they do that every day, maybe for many days or weeks or even years. And then one day they play the piece and suddenly they notice their four measures past the tricky part, having played it without even realizing they did. It became, over time, an implicit task, something their body knows how to do without thinking through the steps. It's, as some musicians say, in their muscle memory. I heard this and thought about watching my child learn to walk. You've watched a baby who's learning to walk, right? So each step is a careful, tentative, thought-out move. Then, moment by moment, they practice, and one day they're running through the house without a single thought as how to move which leg which way and at what time. It becomes implicit. What a blessing, I thought, that compassion can work this way too. Maybe practice won't ever make us perfect, but apparently it can make us good thoughtful practice of compassion, mindfulness of connection, in the small, everyday moments can make us ready to be compassionate, mindful, and connected in those few and scary moments of crisis. So what does practice look like for compassion, for goodness? What shape should spiritual practice take? Unsurprisingly, opinions differ at least as wildly as opinions on the best way to practice a piano. There are a few things about spiritual practice we want to serve, that we want to serve this purpose of building compassion, but the actual shape of the practice can be hugely varied. It can look like the singing meditation we practice with our children. It can look like seated meditation in a Zen center. It can look like yoga or repeating a mantra or walks in the woods or singing in the car, or hell, doing the dishes. That one's not my spiritual practice. <laughs> but it can look all different ways. What it does require are a few simple, consistent qualities to be a practice that makes us more mindful, more compassionate, more connected. Most of them, at least, involve some of what my Zen Buddhist friend calls being where your feet are. Her practice, by the way, other than seated meditation in a Zen center, is doodling sketches of people, places, and things to notice their beauty and cultivate a sense of love for them. It must be some task or activity, though, that gives, asks us to give our attention to 
to the present moment, to the particular space and time we inhabit now. We cannot make implicit, compassionate choices about this moment if our minds are never occupying it. We need to practice first being aware. It also needs to be regular. Just like practicing the piano, we can't decide to meditate three times a year and expect it to be of much benefit to us or to the world. Believe me, I've been personally disappointed about both those truths. The best practices, if you ask me, are daily practices, weekly at the very least. The writer Annie Dillard put it this way, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour and that one and the next one is what we are doing. So to make awareness and loving kindness implicit instead of explicit, we need to make it a habit first. I have a friend who works in an animal shelter and often says, all dogs are trained, some are just trained into behaviors we don't like. And I gotta say, I think that's true of us human creatures too. All of us are trained, whatever we practice habitually, we get good at. For example, I practice crankiness whenever I'm awakened in the morning, and I'll tell you, I'm really good at it. Is that something I want to be good at? That's the greater question, right? Are we good at what we want to be good at? Is it possible we've been practicing ways of being that aren't really teaching us who we want to be? And so finally, this is a tough one for me, our practice needs to be a challenge to us. We touched on this in the story about the Rose Cabin. I don't know about you, but this is the hardest one. To make my practice a challenge to me and to consider it a blessing when it is. Because I love to do only the things I'm already good at. That way, of course, I'm good at everything I do. <laughs> Unfortunately, spiritual practice doesn't work that way. Actual goodness doesn't work that way. When I practice mindfulness, compassion, and connection, at home, in seated breathing exercises or moving yoga, I used to get so annoyed when my toddler interrupted me. He's the average two-year-old level of loud and wild, which is pretty loud and wild. And I would snap at him for making noise downstairs while I sat in the office, or shout at him to leave the room so I could focus on an hour of yoga. Real compassionate and connected practice, right? <laughs> And then my husband asked me casually, after one of these occasions, to your spiritual practice, what are you practicing for? I had nothing. I mean, he went on, if you can't try being mindful through the harmless distractions, like, are you really preparing for the big and actually harmful ones? Like, you know that feeling when your partner is so right you can't even be angry at them for being right, even though you really want to? He was like mind explodingly right that time. Just that time. <laughs> See a handful of other times. Harmless distractions are essential to spiritual practice. Thank God for the harmless distractions that teach us, if we'll let them, how to be present and compassionate and connected so that we can be all of those things when the big, scary, actual, harmful stuff comes up in our lives. So it becomes a really useful discipline if we can take it as a blessing when that harmless interruption rears its ugly head. The child making noise, the traffic outside, the persistent ache in our back, the spiral of thoughts about what to make for dinner and when to schedule a teeth cleaning and oh yeah, I've got to call my Aunt Jane. And to use those interruptions as practice for staying present and connected when something makes demands on our attention. If we never have to call our attention back into this moment, then we won't get very good at it. This all feels hard 
in what seems like a society in one long moral crisis. But with practice, those moments of immediate crisis will arise, and when we're faced with moral decision, <coughs> our bodies will know the answer before we can think it through. We'll jump onto the train tracks. We'll come to the aid of another. We'll be mindful, compassionate, and connected when the world needs us most, when our neighbor does, when we, in the depths of our being, need ourselves to be just that. May it be so. Let us go forth and practice. Amen. for worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Canandaigua, a welcoming congregation. We are located at 3024 Cooley Road, four miles west of South Main Street, Canandaigua, just north of the intersection with routes 5 and 20. Look for the blue signs just before the turn. Your comments about this program or questions about the church are welcome at 585 three nine six one three seven O or at our website www.canandaguauu.org Producer and Editor Daniel Brigham